Okay. Yes, good. Like a okay, good. Okay, hello and a uh, very warm welcome from the Po. My name is Jona Moro and I'm very glad we're all here today. Uh, uh, especially warm welcome to our panel today. Thank you for coming, our critics. Um, and yeah, we're very glad to host another event in cooperation with Verein K. Um, just one thing for for the live stream. Um, if you don't want to your your questions to be heard in the live stream, just don't take the microphone. I'm gonna offer you. Then you will only be heard here in this room. Yes. Um, thank you all for coming and have an interesting evening. Thank you very much. Also, from my side, also thank you to the Pot for having been a long-time partner in, uh, in our programs and uh, for you, uh, for accepting, to you for accepting our invitation to Vienna and uh, also being here for this discussion. Uh, my name is Klaus Speidel. I'm one of the co-founders of Verein K. We've now been active for six years, uh, inviting curators, critics, to Vienna for residencies and also having an ongoing program that's called Crit Cross, where we discuss current writing on art, um, art, art criticism mainly, so in, in the strong sense also criticism, and often have guests as well. So for those who are in Vienna, this is something where you can be on the lookout. It's always announced on, on our website and on social media for Crit Cross. And one very special Crit Cross is always the moment when we have the Visiting Critics program um, where, yeah, we have a chance to get a, an outside perspective of four critics who uh, have been in Vienna for a while and also traveled to Graz. We've had a cooperation with the Steirische Herbst for a few years where they go see the Steirische Herbst. We always do it during Curated By as well because, of course, that's also a very special moment in the, in the Vienna art calendar in the gallery calendar with the invited critics. And it's both a chance to discuss around the notions of art writing, art criticism, and of course to have a perspective, some people would say a reality check as well, some in some cases, on the situation here, here in Austria and observations that we might have, uh, things that we might overlook because we're living here uh, and have been here for a long time. So it's really a great opportunity uh, for the whole Viennese scene to, to hear your points of view. And um, I, last year I started to shift to asking the participants to introduce themselves because some people are extremely good at reading a, a list of bios mm. and I'm extremely bad at it. <laughs> and, and I think uh, it's also nice to already hear your voices and hear you explain um, yeah, what you do in your own voice. So maybe we can start with you, Emir. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us. I'm Emir Krasnice. I'm based in Pristina, Kosovo. I'm an um, um, art writer, freelance. I, I'm mostly... Uh, I do research and by using an oral history methodology to document histories uh, of uh, very recent ones and in the past eight years I've been working in building this open access archive. Um, also I curate and most of my curatorial projects are based in this research that I do and um, it's like an addition platform where I explore communication about certain topics that relate to my country and my context. Um, that would be it. But I like this one. <laughs> Wait, this is a little far. Um, hi, uh, my name is Anya Bonavalsky. I'm based in Toronto, which is in Canada. Uh, I'm also an art writer and a curator, um, and also a journalist and an art critic. I write for publications like Art Forum, Freeze, and Eflux. And I mostly write about uh, sort of confluences between art and music and sound. And so I also write for. Um, actual music magazines like The Wire 
But at Eflux, I run a program called You Can Trust Music, which has to do with the way that um, social and political agencies play out through music and concerns these like kind of like archival potential of, of sonic uh, sonic records and the ways that we can decipher history through music. Uh, I mean, aside from that. I'm also an educator. I teach art criticism and, and art theory in two different universities in Canada. I'm also an affiliate in a third university in Canada in a sociology department where I run a project called Workers Futurists, uh, which, is, which concerns um, blue collar workers in Canada. And, um, and in there I kind of run science fiction clubs with them. We can talk about it afterwards. <laughs> um, but yeah, so nice to be here. Does this work? Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks so much for having me um, and the four of us. Um, I'm Carlos Kong. I live in Berlin, but I'm originally from San Francisco in the US. Um, I have kind of two different sides to what I do. I am a writer. Um, I write art criticism for magazines and also collaborate with artists on artist books, catalogs, um, and other forms of writing. And I. In that vein, I also edit my own, or co-edit actually, I, um, a publication that I co-founded um, with a colleague called The Public Review, which um, is looking at modes of publicness um, in contemporary art practice and is invested in kind of slowing down the process of art criticism. We publish one text per month and we pay according to um, the wage calculator, so it's the living wages per text. Um, we're only publicly funded and we only review ins exhibitions in public institutions. Um, and then my other side is that I'm also doing a PhD in art history and film studies. I teach film studies as well. Um, and then it looks at uh, Turkish-German migration histories um, in contemporary art and film. So specifically how artists are using archival documents from uh, migration histories between Germany and Turkey. Hi, uh, my name is Kanya Mashabela. I'm from South Africa, based in Cape Town. Um, um, as an art critic, I think that most of my work is kind of in the promotion, or may maybe not in the promotion, but more in the platforming of um, artists from Southern Africa. Um, so I write freelance. That could be for mostly African-based publications like Contemporary and in Berlin, and um, local publications like Artthrob, um, also written for Hyperallergic and Aperture, that kind of thing. Um, and then I also work at a private art foundation called A4. Um, and in that capacity, um, it's more about giving opportunities to younger artists and also thinking about how they can work independently um, and find funding, given that um, funding for the arts is so scarce in South Africa. Um, and then in my writing, also interested in art as labor, and then also just labor in general. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this introduction. Um, I would like to start with maybe a um, kind of more general question on your understanding of yourself. You, you used the term art writer in the beginning um, rather than art critic. Was that very intentional? And uh, is that something, how, how do you position yourself in terms of, of this idea of criticism versus art writing? Uh, you just spoke of with a slip of a tongue promoting and then <laughs> platforming artists. So yeah, how do you see a relationship in, uh, in terms of the artists and also the institutions that you write about and for? I mean, yes, it was very intentional, the fact that I say art writing rather than criticism. It's not like I, that I find that there's a huge gap between the two, but uh, it has to do a lot with where I come from, and I think it has to do with the histories of art and how I position myself within it. Um, as, a, as a geography, I, and I, I think I can say that this in a more general term, uh, we haven't done much of work of documenting our, our art histories. And uh, so for me, jumping right, af uh, right at the criticism, it seemed like a big jump. So it, it, it has to do with more taking a bottom-up approach <laughs> where, where you kind of uh, study it, research it, and then you write about it and always perceive yourself as 
leaving some sort of a trail for others, but also a trace, also a footnote. But it's it's never it doesn't have that uh, monolithic feel to it that it's criticism. Although of course we employ a lot of of those tools to unpack a lot of the art that's going on locally and communicating globally in a way through the platforms for which we contribute. So I think maybe it's a safe position, I don't know, uh, but it's just simpler, less complications when I think about it as an activity on the side. And the fact that I do it on the side and it's not central, it also speaks to how dynamic is the art scene and how much I can commit to it. What would be central and... Well, central, I would assume it, it, it would have a more dynamic art scene to begin with and uh, more to, to draw parallels and, and we don't have such a scene for the moment. Uh, and I, I don't think for a small size country that would ever be <laughs> the case. It would be more like either contextualizing yourself largely and bringing your artists and your, I don't know, your infrastructure in a, in a position where it creates more equal relations to what's going on. But I don't know, it, it has to do with the activity uh, that is going on for you to also be intensively active in the writing as well. So when, when the scene is small, it also you, you don't work as much to contextualize that, that, that art. I think, that, I think that's what keeps it in the center or, or in the, on the side of the thing. I don't want to use the term periphery. <laughs> um, yeah, it also really connects with that. I'm coming from a place that is also not in the center, very far from it. I'm just thinking about like um, that, and also just the word art critic, I think in a context where people aren't super familiar with the history of art writing or art criticism or the art world in general, um, critic comes across more aggressive, <laughs> even if sometimes it's not about promoting, but kind of asking people to reevaluate the system, um, which which is part of our work. Um, but um, yeah, I think I think that's partly um, about uh, kind of being, for lack of a better word, from like the margins in some way. So, so it's a bit uh, what what you feel is needed in your context as well, mm -hmm. where you also said that the history is kind of lacking, and mm -hmm. so you try to construct it before you start criticizing the contemporary or so, did I understand it correctly and in your case also making it visible so giving a visibility mm -hmm. as a primary objective or? I mean, your task when there isn't much writing to begin with you, even even that I feel it's a bit old to say I'm criticizing or taking a, uh, occupying such a position where I critique it. Um, mm. In my text, usually I'm, I try to be really um, generous and add something that might, might, we might overlook it. It's there, but then not often structured because we don't exercise certain discourses to talk about our art. So I don't also, yeah, I have to be also I have to be specific and aware about the position I come from. So when I write from from Pristina, it's I'm really aware how not there hasn't been prior uh, writing. So I'm also building blocks, not not trying. It's very easy to undo and find problems with all the works that we see, especially because we're so isolated and <laughs> just not very much uh, part of big big uh, art events aside from manifesta last year so so there's not not much of a and also geo, uh, also as a country very isolated we're talking about a country that perhaps might or might not uh, enter uh, eu zone next year so being as isolated as it is it doesn't always has the urgency to to enter the, the writing as an art. The art form doesn't need the writing always. It can just circulate within exhibition spaces and not be written about it at all. So when going, criticizing in, in, in that traditional sense, where you pull it apart to, to find its issues, 
it's not productive as an activity at all, really. So what you think, uh, how you use your craft of writing, which is, it has its own shortcomings because we're talking about space, we're talking about works that have their own uh, mediums. Uh, so this is another medium in which you're trying to translate it. Like, what? it does question your own work, like why, why would you write the way you write? Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Xenia, can you want to say something? I can add on to that. I mean, um, all of us do other things alongside criticism because it's not a well-paid job, as many of us know in the room. Um, on the other hand, yeah, I mean, I, I do various kinds of writing, but I do identify as an art critic, and I'm invested in criticism that expresses aesthetic judgments, um, in part because I think otherwise it can kind of seep into other forms of conflict of interest in relation to promoting certain, just being a kind of secondary role of just kind of like press support. Um, and I think our job is to, is a kind of stepping stone. I mean, I'm trained as an art historian, so I think and I do identify also as an art historian, so I think also criticism is a kind of um, initial first step such that art histories can be written. Mm -hmm. In that sense, I'm also interested in who gets, the, for me, it's a very political choice of like what gets written about. And as art critics, I think we need to be proactive about deciding actually what we write about for whom um, and what, by doing so, what stories we want to tell, what judgments we want to make. And I think that is a job that involves a lot of responsibility. Um, yeah, and I guess for me it's not so distant also from my academic work, which is also attempting to a bit kind of similar what, with what Ermir was talking about. I'm interested in, like in my academic work, um, historicizing um, younger Turkish German artists who have been left out of um, conventional German or European art histories or as members of society as well. So I'm, yeah, for me also contributing to, for instance, their catalogs or exhibition catalogs, even though exhibition catalogs are often written in a more kind of promotional manner, I think they are the kind of first step for such that art histories can be written ultimately. Um, but yeah, there's this kind of choice involved in how, how the text is framed, but also, yeah, what kind of evaluations one is making. Mm. Yeah, and I think also what's important is like that maybe there's also methodological differences between art writing and art criticism. Um, when I think about art writing, I think of it as, um, so I write these like really long essays and I kind of use art to illustrate maybe like a greater context. Sometimes it can be from like things coming together from disparate contexts. Sometimes it's all kind of contemporary stuff. Sometimes it's something else. And I think about art writing in this way of, of kind of using artwork as these anchor points through which something, the dots connect and something greater appears to you and you can you write about it. And then when I think about art criticism, it's like Carlos said, like a little bit more about kind of shining a little spotlight on things, but like, Strangely, I kind of know I identify as both because sometimes it's actually, our criticism can be limited. Uh, sometimes you're limited to like two or 300 words and you have to really summarize what you're doing and that can actually be very, very productive <laughs> in a really strange way because you kind of just have to say what you want to say and to me, the two practices really feed into each other. Um, yeah, and of course with art criticism, there's this sort of commercial aspect of it that it's it's all about these kind of magazines and bringing people into the fold of these contexts and how you talk about them, hoping that more people will talk about them and uh, in some ways also bringing in people who you think deserve to be looked at or deserve or maybe deserve to be um, looked at in different ways, but um, which, I don't know. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of practice and yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, would you do you also have this um, this divide that Carlos spoke about? On the one hand, like really thinking of yourself as someone who utters evaluations, and on the other, kind of 
building this bigger, you have called it uh, something greater, but this bigger narrative, which probably in your case is around sound and, and music, or, um, or do you um, see yourself more like, um, like oh. Amiri? Uh, I mean, like for me, I feel like it's like something I think of as just like doing my research, but in public. And so I kind of think, I think through things in, in a public forum and, and it's a place, a magazine or a website or whatever can be a place where people respond and they can agree and disagree or add or maybe to refute what you're saying. And that's a risk that you take. But I think that as someone who's also like working in the academic sphere, it's kind of one of the many frequent risks that you have to take if you're hoping to produce work that's actually useful because if you don't encounter these challenges then you're just kind of working in a vacuum. <laughs> so for me it's kind of important to have that, the publicness of that, these my reflections even if they're sometimes critical or not or whatever. Okay, and um, in terms, maybe I can ask the first question because I know that uh, our audience and some have told me are very curious about also your point of view, is there something greater that you saw up here during your stay? Is there like a thread or a narrative around art here that, uh, that, you, that you saw up here? Maybe also in comparison to the context that you've now evoked uh, that you're coming from? I mean, I, I, I saw this uh, shift or let's say, this jump from personal to global very quick, which was interesting to me because in my context, we work a lot with the local and what goes on maybe because of our very dense history in the very, in the last 40 years or 50, like there was so much going on that people are still processing and use art in that way to reflect on what has been going on. So we're very much engaged in our local realities, but also always bringing in um, in the in the external perspective. But here, I just felt that there was you you either saw artists whose practice was very much shaped around their very immediate concerns, which were personal, and then jumping right to ecological issues, bigger issues concerning the entire planet. Um, which I don't know, uh, is, is that market driven or? Oh. <laughs> so the same artists or are these two kinds of artists? Uh, sometimes both, sometimes either uh, deeply personal works or very much um, out there, like speaking on behalf of everybody. I don't know, maybe I'm totally wrong, but that was my impression that there was no middle so, I don't know. I mean, just, uh, it's interesting. I don't know if you ever thought about the question, are there many artists addressing Austria in Austria? I mean, that would be kind of the very, the kind of local, or is that, I, I can't really think, some do, I guess, but it's not. What was your question? Because she said <laughs> there's a jump from the personal, not to the local, but to the global. Right, and so that would mean that there are not many artists addressing the local, which would be Vienna, Austria. I mean, maybe we. Can, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. For but maybe I'm we can talking, stay. I don't, I don't know what's. Uh... Maybe we can stay for the moment with the with this topic and then uh, ask this more very peculiar or particular question. What um, what were you did you did you also perceive some kind of? Uh, yeah. I mean, now that you say that, Eric, and also, I, yeah, I I learned a, a lot of historical information very quickly, but I don't think any of it was necessarily about Austria. Now that I think about it, not necessarily that that's a bad thing. I think it's interesting to look outwards. Um, I, I, we did a lot of studio visits. I was quite interested in the fact that um, no two artists seemed to be working in the same way. Everyone kind of seemed to be uh, very much in their own lane in terms of materials and interests. Um, it, it, it felt quite sincere. Um, 
I, I think that the festival as well, I think that um, just in general, I, I think I was less interested, and in, sorry to, I hope that doesn't sound bad, but less interested in the individual works or artists and more in the underlying structures that, that I, I kind of got a sense of um, while being here in terms of how artists are supported um, and how uh, like festivals like the one in Graz are supported. Um, I thought that was just fascinating from an outsider's perspective. and. Um, yeah. Can you, can you develop that a little bit? Um, yeah, I mean, just that they're supported at all, <laughs> I guess. Um, in South Africa, it's all privately funded. Um, I work at a private institution. We, are, we, our kind of our idea is to 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 kind of support uh, public uh, interaction with art and to expose a, a greater, you know, public to art. But ultimately, we are still private and privately owned, um, and there isn't really much support at all for artists. Um, and their studio practices. Um, so it was really fascinating to see people getting like a studio for six years. Like I think that it's kind of unheard of and um, and, and just the co like the rise of the cost of living in Cape Town in particular because of all of the European tourists. <laughs> but um, it means that like we're constantly getting pushed out um, more and more out of the like the central area of the city. Um, there is you know, nothing stopping the landlord from upping the rent and having you, you know, have to leave. So just um, the sense of stability, um, but also how artists responded to that stability. I kind of came and was like, wow, you get the studio for six years. And sometimes it was kind of like, oh, I hate the studio. I want to move to Brussels or, <laughs> you know, I was, I was kind of interested in the fact that like, it kind of wasn't the be all and end all for the people who had it, um, especially because it's something that we're fighting so hard for in other contexts. Um, um, and just having like a wider art viewing public who cares and uh, a government that cares about, you know, kind of supporting us. Um, and not to say that obviously, I think that um, productive things and generative things come out of people complaining about their context, no matter where that context is, whether it's in Vienna or it's in South Africa. But it was just interesting to see that um, that that's public financial support isn't necessarily um, that isn't like self-actualizing. Like it doesn't like make things um, it doesn't solve the problem necessarily. Um, what did I like? I like I really like the premise of the Strasher herbs. How do you, is this how you pronounce it? Is this how you pronounce it? Strasher herbs. Yeah. Um, a few things I liked about it is that I love this idea of kind of mining the micro histories of a place to find stories that say something else about the world. I thought that was really powerful. And that's also what that's also kind of what's good about any kind of art place or any city that holds a regular art event or festival when it's really able to connect to its own uh, histories and parables to find these ideas that resonate in this kind of like more global context, but maybe if not, then even if it's in its local context. Um, and that was really nice. Another thing that I really liked is that they sort of positioned quite well-known artists with very local artists, and they, I really, I really, really appreciated that actually. I thought that was really nice. Um, and, I, and I thought that the curatorial premise was quite adventurous, like also this idea, like, you know, you know, bad people doing good things and good people doing bad things, and <laughs> like this sort of positioning it has in the world. I think there is like not, a, of course, not all the works were strong, and uh, on some level, I feel like the pressure to produce a, a performance-based festival might be kind of, it's kind of like the means are overpowering the goal a little bit. Like you don't really have to do so much performance. <laughs> <laughs> like the quiet performances were a little long. But I all together actually quite liked it, and then it really made me think. Like I was extremely responsive to it. I wrote the review and the train home. We took like, it was like very fast, and I like I felt very good about it. Um, and then about here, I mean, we haven't seen everything yet. Uh, I know there's the curated by festival, uh, which I really enjoyed looking at the galleries. But I think the theme of curated by the theme of neutrality is a very curious choice in an age where being neutral is an absolute privilege. Uh, and the parable that precedes it is also a very modernist parable, which brings me to this other thought around how many works are really still kind of centered around modernism and how strange that is, <laughs> like modernism and early postmodernism. Um, and it's sort of always coming back to it. And that's kind of the vibe I got. 
And uh, would you say this the centering of works around modernism uh, or postmodernism is a global phenomenon, or is it something you're observing here in particular? Uh, it's something I observe in Europe oh. as of late, and I think it might have to do with because of Russia and the East, and you know, you don't know how many cities are like, oh, this is where the East meets the West. It's not just Vienna or Ljubljana or Berlin or uh, Graz or Kassel. Like everyone thinks they're at the very edge of it. But I mean, that's just <laughs> it's been like that for a really long time. But uh, but I feel like now it's like especially pronounced, and then you have these. Um, yeah, like, so I think there's like, in part, the modernism approach is, feels a little bit like nostalgia for a type of utopia that might have been uh, like in, on people's minds at some point. And in other parts, it's like, it is sort of the, the privilege to, for like this neutral slumber. And they're just like hoping that you close your eyes and it all goes away. So uh, also a form of apoliticality, even though it's like this declared politicality of looking east. Yeah. In the art, you feel like an, a form of apoliticality of, of modernism, or, or what's the sense? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, Carlos. Yeah, I mean, I also was thinking about the Stadish Herbs framing around the proximity of Graz and Austria as a whole to uh, the former East. Um, I thought it was very effective or provocative, at least. Um, the various stagings of artistic practices from the region um, and speaking about the infrastructures of war and how that is something that all of Europe faces um, at the moment. Um, yeah, maybe we can talk more about Scottish Herbs after that, but something else I observed in, in Vienna, I, I mean, it's hard to summarize after sure. just this time, but I observed certainly a diversity of practice. There was uh, seem to be works like what Xenia was just talking about that were more formalist, that seemed to me as well to be shown in more commercial settings. Um, perhaps the formalism was market driven as well. I also then note on the flip side saw, or we saw a good number of kind of artistic research based works and it seems even from what we didn't see, I, I can, from what I've gathered or looked up, it seems like there's also a kind of strong artistic research happening in Vienna. Um, and I was also struck with the kind of structures of support and studios that Kanye was talking about. I mean, it is, there's also, of course, funding for the arts in Berlin, but it is different. And I think the studios are much nicer here. There's also, yeah. Um, seems like the cost of living and the structures for being an artist here are still um, more livable than they are in Berlin at the moment. Um, I was, however, also struck because I'm very interested in artists with, for lack of a better term, migration backgrounds in Europe um, and who come from minorities, um, especially from histories of labor migration or political exile. I was struck, of course, by um, how all the artists that had these amazing studios were white and Austrian or from German-speaking parts of Europe. It wasn't lost on me that that's also a reality of who has access to the um, very wonderful spaces for art production um, in the city, which does not also reflect the entirety of the whole city's artistic ecosystems. And in that sense, like I was also really intrigued by like the Mai Ling exhibition at the Secession, which is also... Um, discussing marginalized groups in Vienna and artistic activism, uh, specifically in Vienna and in art institutions. I also, I, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, just thinking back to the festival, especially when I'm traveling, um, although I'm really interested in formalist works uh, for, um, in different contexts, um, I'm also, you know, when you're in a different context, you kind of want to learn more about the place. Um, and I think that happened at, uh, at the festival. Sorry, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, especially the Demon Radio exhibition was really worth going to. I'm also kind of interested because I remember, um, we were, again, we were talking to a, um, an artist at their studio, how many people went to Graz to see the festival or are planning to go, because I was hearing a lot of people kind of get stuck in Vienna and don't travel outward. So that was also interesting. Um, and even now talking, I kind of wish that I was asking the audience questions instead of the other way around because 
um, I don't feel like I got to necessarily hear what Viennese people think about um, the artists in their ecosystem. Um, disconnected to that anyway um, was, um, I think in the curatorial kind of statement um, at the festival, there was something interesting said, which was that, um, and, and also just in the conversations I had moving around, that it was difficult to talk about colonialism in like the African context or the South American. Um, and so the, same, like, the kind of focus was placed on Eastern Europe because the idea was not to, um, to allow the, um, Austrian people to think, oh, that's uh, a problem that somebody else has or another country has. I'm, I'm not sure how much that um, resonates with people. Um, but um, I think that it was in some regards an overcorrection um, in the sense that it meant that I didn't see any black artists at the festival and so, or any artists of color necessarily except for, except for like one, I think. Um, three, yeah, maybe two. Um, and that felt kind of weird as well. It kind of felt like um, we're not engaging with people because we don't utilize their works, but it kind of presupposes that um, artists of color are only making works about their identity and nothing else. And, and that, that in it, they can't connect to the idea of this humans or demons. You know, it, it, it felt a bit weird. Um, um, and just generally felt weird. Like, um, you know, in Europe, I've mostly been to like Paris and stuff. So kind of the, the homogeneity was a little bit strange for me sometimes. But um, in general, I thought it was an incredible festival. And I learned more about um, Eastern European histories and, um, and uh, Austrian histories. The uh, Dr. Jazz thing at uh, Demon Radio was excellent. There was an incredible archive of, of music and um, just the, the thinking was was clearly really um, was really um, evolved and really interesting um, in general. And I, I could see that a lot of the the white artists were thinking about you know thinking about blackness and all of those things. So it wasn't as if it was completely excluded. It, it was just curious to me uh, to see the exclusion of those artists. Yeah, I mean, as, as, as far as I've understood, and I'm also not from here, I came here in 2015, the question of colonialism is um, an interesting one in Austria because on the one hand, people feel quite safe because they didn't really have colonies like France or Belgium had them, but then on the other, some people are saying, well, you know, we did somehow colonize the European East and this is not usually called colonialism. And so maybe that's what you're talking about in terms of the shift of, of focus. Um, yeah, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, you wouldn't say somehow. Yeah, it's a form of colonialism, but of course, doesn't normally run under the standard term because it's in another region. It's not an island. Mm -hmm. It's not a place in the sun, as the German yeah. famously said when they were looking towards colonies and they said, well, we also want our place in the sun, basically was a German ambition for colonies. Mm -hmm. And um, um, yeah, so... But it's an important, uh, important point, and I'm I'm glad you're you're raising it. You already started a little bit to talk about your also the things you appreciated or per particular positions you appreciated. Um, the demon radio you mentioned. Um, what were other kind of interesting positions you saw? Now, like going from this kind of more global look, what were the tendencies observed or the trends you observed to? to the more particular, whether some artists that you particularly noticed or some institutions, exhibitions, or galleries. Um, Carlos, do you want to continue? Sure, yeah. Um, many things I saw I really loved, um, even if they, I didn't necessarily relate to them um, on all <laughs> levels, <laughs> levels, aesthetically or politically, but I. Um, really loved everything I saw. I have to say, I'm. I was especially. There was one show in Graz that was very special, at the Grazer Kunstverein um, by Pan Dai Jing, a Chinese artist who lives in Berlin, um, who works a lot with sound um, and film. And that was a really special exhibition because it also. It was very minimal but very immersive. So it really was, um, for me playing with the boundaries or the limits of an exhibition or what is possible, what an exhibition itself means. It also, kind of in contrast to Sajda Herbst, I mean, one can read political things into it about Hong Kong and certain contexts, but it really wasn't about anything. It was very abstract, and yet there were always references to the body or other things that were almost in reach but somehow defied comprehension, and I really like that. It's, it was a challenge, also as an 
art critic, if we're talking about criticism, to even say what it's about because it's not really a show about anything. And that was very kind of special for me. Um, I enjoyed the My Ling show a lot. I enjoyed the show at Exile um, that Pinar Urenji curated. Um, I enjoyed many of the studio visits as well. We had a lovely one today with Sophie Toon, which was very interesting. Um, <laughs> I already, I think I already touched upon this. Yeah, you did. Yeah. You know, already spoke about but it. But also, you have beautiful exhibition spaces. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I mean, I, beside from what Carlo mentioned, I, I, I don't think I, I haven't seen bigger shows. You, you've been more out. We're seeing, as you know, uh, we're seeing Kunsthalle tomorrow, and we're seeing some greater show tomorrow. So we're halfway our. Uh, visit. I I also really like the the, the exhibition at uh, Graz Kunstverein, especially because of that impossibility to represent archival traces and how generative as a process that became and how the exhibition became another opportunity to create other sources. To it, it was like a premediation on another exhibition that we were seeing at the exhibition. So. I like that one as well because it had that impossibility to, to, to capture it and to, to confine it to a text, basically. I, I guess we were all tempted by it. Um, I, uh, I don't know, uh, there were artists that we met that I liked. I, I noticed there was a lot of embroidery among uh, as a new media that I haven't seen it. Also, some glaciers that seemed like ceramic, but they were. So I, I noticed some the technical aspects which yeah. I haven't seen in, in a while, and were a bit traditional, but also recontextualized, which I appreciated, and it was a novelty. Mm. But I don't have names. I'm not going to drop names. So. Yeah, that was the downside of getting confronted by so much work at the same time. I, I, I still haven't uh, gone through all my photos and like searched and put the names to the, to the works. But um, do, you, do you guys remember that? his name was Danny, the Israeli? Uh, yeah, yes. Incredible videos, really liked them. Um, Could you repeat the name? Danny Gal. Danny Gal. Yeah, yeah. That was really great. Um, and then there was also, um, sorry, the Ukrainian artist who was talking about um, um, basically demon possession of Ukraine. Um, yeah, and the, and the Amazing. I thought it was really fantastic. I um, mean, it was. These are also. <laughs> these are also. Um, these are also issues that, um, you know, obviously being right next to it. Um, um, I guess Ukraine is, is like on the top of people's minds. Um, and of course, we're thinking about it in South Africa as well for other reasons. Um, our relationship with Russia and our history of Russia is really weird, um, and as is our relationship with America. Um, um, and so we think about it in those terms, but to, to kind of see, um, you know, how, uh, how war and genocide and those things are depicted in this context, especially because um, it's hard not to get... Um, solipsistic when there's things happening in your own places, but kind of remembering that the connections are so deep. I'm thinking about how people, um, how people digest trauma and how they kind of, how it changes how they enact with the world and, and how that uh, digestion is not necessarily universal, but is, is like infinitely relatable in some way. I, I thought was just, um, was super interesting. Thank you. Maybe uh, we can take a first moment to take uh, questions or thoughts from the audience. Is there someone who would like to ask either one of them about their practice or uh, wants to know a little bit more about their experience or their understanding of their craft and art? Not, not for now? No. I'd love to, as Kanye, suggested I'd love to ask you guys some stuff. Would anybody be interested in a conversation? Uh, and maybe somebody who's, has anybody been to the festival in Graz? What do you think? Because we're just in these like press tours with other journalists, so what do you think? <laughs> Yes. Mm -hmm. And we usually don't go to public 
with opening. any weekends. First, I noticed, or I seem to notice, that there's a certain ambivalence towards the word art critic, which I fully understand. Plus, also, like, this strange role of, on the other hand, trying to support a certain artistic practices, I imagine, or at least scenes or context, that you could help sort of introduce to a potential, whatever, art history, art context, etc. And it's funny that um, there was some aspects of that this seems to be formal and that could be sort of market-based. I'd say, for instance, the rise of artistic research in Vienna is also market-based because it's one of the biggest fundings there is available. So there's kind of like this strange ambivalence too. And then actually, if to turn this into a question, I'd rather be interested in how do you perceive um, how much is the entity who is able to write text to support certain art practices or to let's say, uh, allow people to translate, uh, understand, even critique, but maybe like reveal certain aspects. How do you see your role as some kind of collaborateur uh, in this strange game of sort of like the, the in a way sort of very um, needs to be protected art world because it's a miracle that it still exists. And on the other hand, it immediately turns into these strange sort of mechanisms and formalisms like on a general, social scale and which 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 allows us to kind of criticize any structure because the only artist name like I heard four artist name and I want to like what 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 made the decision to visit them is it are they part of the Phileas network yeah. yes no yeah. like why is this person that I heard being hyped so much although her work is not really developing uh, you know what I mean yeah, so yeah. it's kind of like um, basically you're becoming a communicating entity and I wonder if this is part of this whole, especially also with regard sort of like the various art worlds mm -hmm. that collide within a society, especially in Vienna, mm -hmm. whereas, and, and we even had the, and I blame it on the moderation, um, the, uh, the aspect of aren't the artists working about local Austria? Yes, they do if they collaborate within the districts, if they do artworks in if they have a fully different understanding of their artistic practice, maybe then people who supply the art world with, with artworks that remind us of what modernism used yeah. to be. Yeah. So I'm kind of... <laughs> That's what we were wondering. Actually, it's, you know, we don't, we don't get the full context of why that person is relevant and we don't necessarily, you know, kind of plan the trips. But, I mean, all interesting, but we don't know what the, you know, what the internal workings are, how the funding structure works, all of those things. Um, but also just to answer your question about commercialization and how to select artists, it's also such a funny question because uh, actually Xenia asked me earlier today, um, has my relationship changed with the artists that I'm friends with, who I was friends with since art school? Um, and I, when I, I, I guess I was thinking about it in the back of my head, and when I began writing about them, they weren't selling anything, right? They were just like in their studio struggling. And so, um, and I wasn't, you know, nobody knew who I was either. So it all just felt very earnest. Um, and it's, I, I think that's also part of it. I think that because, particularly in my country, I'm, I'm, I can't speak for everybody, but as a writer, I've, I've always kind of considered myself to like not be that valued in terms of the hierarchy of like, um, you know, curator, artist, gallerist, blah, blah, blah. But it is always important to remember that we, we still have power and that we are promoting or platforming whether we'd like to or not uh, particular people as we write about them. And now these friends do have galleries and they are selling work. Um, and me just taking a photo with them and posting on Instagram is in a sense this weird promotion. Um, so, so yeah, in a sense those relationships weren't commercialized at the beginning but have become commercialized and I think that's kind of an interesting process. Oh, we don't know why I elucidate the question because it's a bit of a question to us mm -hmm. uh, of, of how are people chosen. I mean, one is we're sponsored by the uh, Bundeskanzleramt and for them it's important that we see the artists in their studios, so that's one part. And then we have nominators mm -hmm. um, each year for the critics and they nominate artists. So the hope is that by mm -hmm. delegating the nomination, not doing it ourselves, we get a diversity of, okay. of artists each year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, um, but there's more to be said to this question, I guess. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm. There was a lot in your question, so I don't know yeah. if I got all of it. But I agree with 
what you pick said. Something. I agree with what you said that there. I mean, it's would be foolish to think that the in contemporary society the art critic is not implicated in a market structure. Of course, that's the case. Um, I don't have also have ambivalence about being an art critic. I am one. I just like it <laughs> is a title that I have no problem um, taking on. But I do think that criticism is more capacious than a simple yes or no, mm. good or bad judgment, which yeah. I think is too often expected that that is what criticism is. When for me, criticism, if I allow myself to be a little like philosophical or utopian, that it is for me an art form that allows the reader to see the artwork anew. It's a, not only, it's a translation and historicization and contextualization and critique all at the same time um, that also takes place with a narrative. Mm -hmm. And it allows the reader to see something that they, and experience something that mm -hmm. they wouldn't have done otherwise if they hadn't read the text, which it's very hard for that to actually happen in a text, which is why a lot of writing isn't, isn't very good. Yeah. Um, but that's for me the kind of ideal. Um, I also didn't want to set up a false dichotomy between like abstract formal and, mm -hmm. Um, artistic research, which is also a very problematic category. Mm. Um, I think, personally, coming from an academic background, but that's a different issue. Um, but I do know there's a lot of like funding for artistic research as an emerging thing, the extent of its commercialization. I, I'm not really sure. I mean, I think everything, every art form, operates under intense pressure of translation into different institutional formats and because of that commercialization, I don't think any thing is immune, like, immune to it and that's for me not a value judgment as well on the practice. I think many, we saw many in Graz, like uh, also formalist, for me also formalist practices um, can be very political and can be driven, can be the result of a lot of research. Um, and how an artwork takes its form and what its ability to communicate mm -hmm. histories, aesthetic qualities, information if it wants to, that for me is something that we can evaluate as critics. And, and I think also, just to add to a little bit of that, is that many critics are also artists and many critics are also curators. So one thing about it is that it's also kind of part of the community. In some ways, um, one of the, Kind of a, a fun way to look at our criticism is like follow is like I have a two or three critics who I, I trust their taste like I read their reviews and then I go see the shows that they recommend I know it's like kind of simple but like there's also like a generational aspect to it like there's like a sort of like aspirational aspect to also like kind of relating to other people in your community who do writing um, yeah so there's so there's like also that and yeah the commercial kind of stuff I mean. Yeah, it's definitely a part of it, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's like the biggest part. Of, I kind of, I personally shy away from uh, writing about the big names because I just, I just feel like I don't have mm. that. Like I write a lot about like sort of outsider weirdos and people <laughs> who already died a long time ago and stuff like that. And people are like, kind of like, you know, like they let you, they still let you do that. So, yeah. If I could just add one quick thing about commercialization, which just came into my head is that for me, the issue of commercialization is one, is the issue of publicness. It's who is art for is actually the bigger question. If it's, and of course, the, where art ends up is um, part of its life cycle, but um, in a life cycle in a capitalist market. But the question of, for me, commercialization is ultimately who is the work of art for and who does it serve? And yeah, a work that goes. I don't know. I don't want to actually expand on that, but that's what I'll... But also, offer. just kind of connecting to that, like, who's reading art criticism? I, I often have that question. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm often wondering, that, like, who am I writing this for? Because um, especially, um, and, and, and I kind of mentioned this before, but, like, especially coming from, like, a Southern African context um, and thinking about the dialogues about Africa, we were kind of talking about um, the kind of commercialization of art in the sense that things are kind of spoken about as, as a trend. Um, and contexts are kind of trending. Um, and, and I wonder how much the artists working in Ukraine or in Eastern Europe could connect to that feeling of African artists being talked about as like, oh, Africa's hot right now, you know? <laughs> that kind of like feeling that you're kind of being essentialized and, and whether I'm contributing to that when I write to inspire, 
you know, it's for international publications. Like, are they asking me to write about these exhibitions because they genuinely think they're interesting or because they need some African content? Um, it's, it's, um, and, I, and I know sometimes that is the case, right? But um, and especially in a context where I know that most of the readers of those publications are never gonna go to South Africa to go see the show, you know? Um, but for me, when I read international content, it's because I wanna be transported, you know? I wanna, I wanna learn something about a context that I don't know about. Um, and I'm, I'm not always sure how mutual that feeling is. Um, so I guess uh, and we often kind of like kind of try to validate and justify ourselves in our existence, which can be complicated. And I think that's why I feel weird about using the term critic, because I know that sometimes I am specifically writing about an artist because they talk about a history that I'm trying to, to kind of make more visible. And I, uh, or they're connecting with particular issues that I'm trying to like, yeah, to kind of blow up. So even when I talk about promotion, I'm not necessarily even talking about like, art like kind of financial promotion, but more kind of promotion of, of particular ideas and, and, and moments and events that have happened uh, to, to kind of try and be seen. Um, and then I think sometimes, okay, you're doing all of that, but the vast majority of the public in South Africa has no art education, doesn't go to museums, hasn't seen the national galleries, um, feels intimidated by the actual facade, you know. Our national gallery is in this big old British Victorian Dutch kind of building. Most people are too scared to walk inside. Most people are too scared to walk into like the white cube spaces, even though they're free, because they just don't feel wanted. It feels like this like designer luxury shop. So, um, you know, I'm talking about like really like kind of traumatic moments in like African history or South African history or Zimbabwean history, and I wonder who I'm writing them for. Is it like a white upper class, or is it like people that look like me? It's kind of complicated. I don't know. Um, I think it's getting better. You know, more people getting access. And, um, and I've had people come to me and say that, I've, like, that they've seen my writing sometimes. But it's also, I think being young, it's weird to think that you have any impact on people, that like you kind of feel like you're just writing into the void. Um, so I don't know, I, I don't know how you guys feel about that one. Sorry, I speak fast hey, as well. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, hey, my name is Mickey Moore and I work as an artist in a gallery at UK and a big museum for modern art. And actually, I'm also very, so also for coming f for discussion like this, I was always also thinking about, to talk about, so this question of whom am I writing for? Mm -hmm. And also like this idea of um, uh, to have, um, to write, about complex things for an audience that is not familiar with the vocabulary that's mm -hmm. exchanged easily, mm -hmm. but more to use, uh, like, to, and to really think of where you publish and uh, for what, yeah, what do you, what are your aims? What mm -hmm. do you do? Do you want to deal with it? So not just to think about market and mm -hmm. places, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. somehow like this. I mean that really resonates with me uh, like of who we're speaking to I don't have an when I'm asked who I write for it's really hard to actually to answer your question because I don't it's hard for me to think about um, an ideal audience or a particular audience. And if I were actually honest about who that is, it's not, unfortunately, I also would have to say that my writing is not for the broadest audience or it's not journalism as well. But I think this is, I can say from a kind of, because, and I can elaborate, because I also, in my word choices, maybe in the topics and the style that I write in, it perhaps could be not the most approachable, but for me, that's, I would justify that in the kind of art form, that for me, it's an art form, and so I have to use the language that I use, but yeah. that's why, kind of from my editorial perspective with the publication that I've written, that I co-edit, like I'm, we're really in, invested in criticism that speaks its idea clearly, that yeah. is situating the exhibition or the work of art in a broader social dialogue that touches on a social issue. We also, because we pay this living wage, we're most interested in writing or finding writers who really would actually benefit them to publish a text. Um, 
a lot from a lot of first time writers, of students who have just finished. We're kind of interested in thinking about who we want the art writer to be as well. Um, but I think the, I personally feel that like the kinds of, that we have a lot of responsibility and the choices we make of who we write for and how we write and the venues and yeah, how we, if we want, if and how we want to make it a more sustainable practice. Yeah, I think I was just like thinking, I was like, who, <laughs> at first we were like, who am I speaking to? I'm like, anyone who would listen. And then I'm like, maybe myself. <laughs> because one of the things that happens with that kind of writing too is that, as we've seen, like, it's not always, I mean, one of the, gr the best things about um, art writing or critical writing is that I get occasional amazing emails from people who like work in this entirely different field and live in a really different place saying that they enjoyed this or that. Uh, but one other thing I can think about is also that it not, may not be right now, but it could be like in the future. Mm -hmm. Like somebody, like maybe 20 years from now, your work is in the, a festival, like the one in Graz, and then people are really thinking about your body of work and how it happened. Like, and you kind of have to be like, oh yeah, at this point in my life, I made this link between this person, this context, this place, this artist or whatever. And it's like, that's also part of it. So. I mean, just kind of thinking more broadly about it might be kind of helpful <laughs> too, like just kind of like taking a little bit of the immediate pressure off the writing. I think I, I, I mostly write about for the artists themselves. I, I think I, in many of the comments that I got, it's, it's that I, I help them shape their practice a lot of those things that they don't understand how how their their work is affecting others it, it, then through text they can they can be more aware of it which is not a problem in Vienna people here are way more aware of, of how how about their working methodology but not in the context in which I work not always artists are receive the education um, that is good quality and that could have them compete in, in, I don't know, or participate in these larger contexts of art. So from them I noticed that things that they were not aware of, they were kind of putting a name, at least a tag word, and, and just made them more aware of the dialogues part of which they are and they intervene in. So I think that's, that's the most, um, valuable thing that I can contribute with my art writing. Uh, beside that, I, uh, <laughs> I don't see the point. <laughs> 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 no, I see the point, but I think that's most important to, to have a clear uh, beneficiary and that, that, is mo that, is, that is the, the artists themselves. <laughs> okay, sorry, hi, I'm Taylor. Um, I don't know what I am. I go to art things sometimes and write about them and think about them, but I'm not a critic. I don't have an art history background at all. Um, but a, it's more of a comment than a question, but I do have a question that's very disconnected from <laughs> the comment I'm about to make. But thank you for communicating everything I've been <laughs> thinking. I've been living here for the past three years and like Klaus's comment really got me where like, what is the local conversation? Or like, what is the local person commenting about the local context mm -hmm. and what I've really envisioned, which maybe you haven't seen it because the majority of the artwork that I see commenting on this local context are artists of colors and also artists from migrant backgrounds um, and kind of this conversation around the development of art history and how that process works. And I think that like even in Austria, art history is not finished mm -hmm. at all. And in fact, there's kind of like this development of a critique um, or a new perspective being brought to the art scene, even from the past, so like kind of this discovery of like people of color in old artworks, who are they, no one's questioned who they are, but now we're having a conversation, who are these people that are in the backgrounds of these paintings from like the 1700s, 1600s, that are in Austrian artists' paintings, but also even history of Austria's colonialism, which isn't just Eastern Europe, but also Africa, through exploration and also um, involvement in colonial expansion with Germany. Um, and artists that work on that, like Belinda Kosminski is an artist that works on that in a local context about the human zoos that were happening in mm -hmm. Prater, and she does um, video installation work that comments on these histories as well. 
and also even a performance that happened this past weekend um, from a group called Legacies of Healing for Wien Woche. Also did a commentary on um, this local context of human zoos and the representations of basically enslavement mm -hmm. in that context in Austria. So I think it's really interesting because these conversations are happening in the art scene, but like who is getting the funding to present that history yeah. is a big question. Um, and I think like that's an interesting conversation because even as someone that's an outsider as well that's come in, I've also decided, oh, I can actually, I feel empowered to do um, artistic intervention because it feels accessible, but then when you're in it, it doesn't feel accessible anymore as a person of color, I guess. So it's like, oh, there's so much funding, there's so much this and there's so much that, but then it's like, once you're attempting, it's a bit exclusionary about what you are allowed to talk about. And so I think it comes from a history of kind of a lack of self-reflexiveness um, in dealing with specific past that is really difficult to talk about in an Austrian context. And as a historian, it's been difficult to talk to Austrian friends of mine as well about historical context and like acknowledgement and how do we deal with these histories. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily something that's not being dealt with. I just don't think it's yeah. widely visible. Um, so I encourage people to look yeah. into the artists that are doing that. Um, and yeah, I haven't seen the Curated By exhibition yet, but I also do think neutrality is an odd <laughs> choice <laughs> um, for a, um, yeah, I don't know how you're neutral in these times. I think it's really interesting to think through and I'm now curious, I think I'll go and see the exhibitions. But yeah, and I guess my separate question is, um, that's discombobulated from this, um, is who is an art critic? Like who's allowed to be art critics? Because I think um, something I'm toying with is like accessibility to these conversations. Like when I talk to my mom about these things, like she has a lot of commentary, I guess, like if I show her <laughs> a piece and she's like, but she doesn't have like this whole aesthetics background and I don't have an aesthetics background, but are we allowed to have an opinion or are we allowed to have <laughs> an opinion on what happens in art and is the public like opinion of art valuable or is only those that come from this very specific academic background with the specific language, are their voices, what is the end all be all on the pieces? So yeah, that's my question. Thanks. Yeah, you, know, you want to follow up on that? I, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> now I feel like we're, we're not gonna, I'll go back to what you were saying as well, but I, I wanted to say this as well because I, I kind of come from a commercial context partly, um, having worked at an art fair and, um, and having worked at commercial galleries as well. I think that the work that galleries do is incredibly important, um, but, and I think collectors are important. I think collectors are incredibly important in sustaining that kind of interest. But the problem as well is, of course, that, uh, you know, art's become, in a sense, art itself has become a trend for really wealthy people. And so, I mean, some of the conversations I was having, for example, at like Freeze London, and also even just by gallerists who were kind of being a little bit unethical in their engagement, like people go to South Africa um, saying they just wanted a booth and then end up kind of like enticing the artists away to leave their galleries who had supported them from the beginning. Um, and, and even in that, like going to Freeze London and having like the booth be swamped by people who want this artist but they don't really know how to say their name and they don't really seem to care about anything they're making but like Periton told me you know it's just like um 
It's more that, you know. And I think that that's partly our job as writers is to to underlie that hype with substance so that it's not just like bubbles on top of the champagne, but something that like actually like that actually lasts longer. Um, and also, thank you for your recommendations. I think that the yeah, I mean, I mean. It's funny, historically, I know that these uh, things happened, and I know that about the, you know, the human zoos you're talking about, but to, you know, it's really not easy to learn about the contemporary Austrian art scene, especially if you don't need to speak German. Um, um, so that's really interesting. Gonna, gonna do my research. Um, um, and what was your, I can't even remember your second question. It's, it's around who has the right to speak oh, about has, art. Yes, okay, thank you for jogging my memory. I think sometimes it's almost like being a writer. Like nobody can come to you and say, hey, you're a writer now. You kind of just have to like take that title and say, I'm a writer and just write. Um, and I think that if you wanted to engage and start writing about art and being an art critic, that's up to you, even if it doesn't feel that way all the time. I think it's the same thing about being an artist. Nobody endows you with the name artist. There's no degree that you have to do. You just get to decide that you're an artist, even when the world doesn't make you feel like that's the case. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's how I became an art critic. I just started writing. Oh criticizing or critiquing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I thanks for your question and your, also your mm -hmm. comments and question. I, what you, a lot of what you said resonated with me and my interests. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm familiar with Bill and his work and think very highly of it um, and have some shared context with it, um, especially also in relation to artistic research, which I mentioned. Um, and I also know that like, I mean, there's also so much happening in Vienna, which is wonderful. Like the whole time we've been here, there's Fienbocke as well, which has had, I know has had a really amazing program. We haven't been able to go to all of it. Um, I also saw that there was like a, a talk here, I guess it was last week about um, a provisional museum of migration, which is something that really interests me. Um, and kind of in my own research, I also, in my kind of academic stuff, which for me is also a modality of criticism, I also come across a lot of um, Kurdish and Turkish um, diasporic communities here. Um, obviously, there's a big also um, uh, post Yugoslav, let's say, or kind of connection with Southeastern Europe here. And so that, um, I think these histories are um, very much worth exploring um, and looking into more. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think. We're also at critical, the discourses on contemporary art or contemporary culture more broadly develop so quickly. It can be, they can develop faster than information is available, I feel like sometimes. And there are buzzwords that become thrown around, let's say, where everything, we need to decolonize everything, or everything needs to, <laughs> you guys know what I mean. And I think um, it can take great, levels of research to actually find out historical truths such that memory cultures don't get weaponized, which I feel like I can speak on behalf of Germany. I think it's absolutely the case um, where there's a refusal to look at certain histories um, and acknowledge certain peoples and because of a need to justify other histories or other grand narratives. Um, and as opposed as the, for the last question of who is an art critic, I mean, I think perhaps I also contradict myself when I think I when I think an art critic has an art historical responsibility, which I do partly feel, which is maybe my like conservative side. But I also <laughs> think I absolutely the other half of me totally disagrees with that. I think an art critic is someone who feels compelled to write about art um, and who has something to say mm -hmm. and who feels compelled in a way that also sometimes can't be explained. There's no also. Even if you studied art history, there's no clear path to becoming an art critic. It's a very strange um, profession or side profession. Um, I started it when I was studying. I had just fin graduated university and I had a random year studying in Heidelberg in southern Germany. And I felt totally lost and out of touch with the world and in a really new surrounding. And I felt like my only way of kind of orienting myself was if I wrote about what I was seeing. And, um, it had nothing actually to do with what I learned in a classroom. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to answer the question of how who gets to be an art critic, but I can maybe tell you how I became an art critic. 
and I think that that's maybe also some of, uh, I totally agree with uh, what both of you said, is that, but also it kind of shows you how everybody gets to it from a different place. Uh, for me, I come from a, like an organizing background, so so much of my first writing was like, we want this, and, and we like this, and then which evolved into collectives, which evolved into pamphlets, which evolved into longer statements, artists, collectives that took over buildings, had exhibitions, it became exhibition texts, and then participating in other institutions, being asked to write other texts for other artists who are also have active agendas, and then later to be <laughs> like called for write for magazines and other things about art or issues related to art. I did my master's degree when I was 35. I don't think I'll ever do my PhD, and I started my academic career around there too, and I don't think that it's like really my focus. <laughs> but I think that it's like, for me, that's, that practice has evolved from that sort of initial practice of writing, and it continues to evolve. And so who knows what I'll be writing in 10 years, maybe, I don't know, could be anything really, it could be like menus or, or like, <laughs> like whatever. Uh, but it continues to evolve, maybe like sometimes in public, sometimes in private, but it's a form of writing, you know, what I would say who gets to be an art critic is mostly people who already write. Mm. So, yeah. I also don't have a clear path how I started to write. I, I, I did receive some training uh, as part of my um, BA in art and philosophy and literature. So I did this interdisciplinary education, but then when I, when I was done with education, I, I, I came back home and it was totally a different system of how we understood our society and our context. So. It took me a year, a year, oh God, it took me years to understand where I stand first and foremost to be able to write. Mm -hmm. It was, education didn't really um, play a huge role uh, in it. it. I had to relate to what was going on and that took me, um, I don't know, it was mainly through oral history um, uh, practice. I, I do sit with people and I think most of my education I received in the later years in my life was one-on-one, -on -one, just sitting and listening. And that gave me the certainty to, to write. And that's why I was a bit, my and I'm going back to my previous comment, why I was surprised that I didn't encounter much local context was because without knowing the local context, I couldn't write about any of the artists mm -hmm. in my country. Because if I didn't know well the war, mm. I couldn't read all the works that related to the war. And that shaped generations of artists. Like if I didn't know, ex <laughs> have the proper language for it, and if I didn't recognize the suffering of all the parties involved, that, that would never give me the balance to, to write about it because it would become very deeply problematic. Mm. So I think it was, Mostly this bottom-up education that I received after going back home that kind of gave me the certainty to, to write about art. And then how I realized this was when I, w I started writing about the younger generation that they departed from war. They don't want to deal with war at all. They have other issues that are pressing and are, are local. And that's where I realized that I, I felt like I, I was the rug was pulled from under, like I had no context. I had to build a new one and understand this new generation. What are they talking about? And for me, most of the time, that's how I learned about, I learn about context through, through artists and how are they engaging with it. That's why this time I didn't feel like I, I learned much mm -hmm. locally, but I, I guess it also has to do with, with the kind of artists we were introduced and, and limitations and shortcomings that came with it. I think you speak to a really important quality. Uh, it's about curiosity, ultimately. Um, and I think that that's, like I started writing poetry and fiction. Like I was writing an English literature degree. Um, and then I was hanging out with artists and going to studio, I mean, going to gallery openings, partly because it was just a social hangout. And then um, got more curious because I was seeing history in these works that I didn't get taught in high school and didn't really have an understanding of. And so it was just a, a way to, for me to, to learn my context and to do that. To, uh, think out loud, as you said earlier, as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, one one thing I also heard because you also spoke about your mother, and maybe the question wasn't only who can become an art critic, but also who yeah. has a right to 
to actually appreciate art and like have an opinion on art and um, and I, I mean there's this famous quote by some uh, film critic who says the problem is everybody has two jobs their own and film critic <laughs> and and then he seems to think that's a problem you know but maybe I think with art it's similar and sometimes I'm a bit angry about it because everybody thinks they need to be able to like it and if they don't then the artist may, did something wrong. Uh, there is this kind of mm. demand mm, I think that's that why art be understandable mm. and that it provokes some emotions in the audience. Mm. And um, and people think that when they look at old art, it's okay. You know, they can they can like a virgin and child. But the truth is that this understanding is of course an illusion because the whole context is missing. So they think because it's representational art and they get some feeling out of it. They're actually understanding the old art in the KHM and they're not understanding the contemporary art in the Kunsthalle. Mm. But I think that's largely based on a kind of illusion that, you know, there's a historic continuity from someone painting the Virgin with Child to mm. them. And, um, and I, but resonating also with what Carlos said, um, the idea that maybe writing about art in our time can give people of the future a look into our minds. Mm. Um, means that a lot of people should be actually writing yeah. what they experience mm -hmm. or recording it mm -hmm. because now we the only access we have to the minds of people from the 18th century is Diderot, mm -hmm. is Lichtenberg, mm -hmm. is as some people would say white men um, also because they were mostly the ones who got to write their stuff and so if we want people to access our way of seeing the art of our time I mean mm -hmm. there should be diverse voices being heard, so, so two, two things. So I, I feel a bit ambiguous about this question, you know. Um, yeah, should everybody be appreciating the things and should, I, I do think that the audience is not right to expect that they understand everything yeah, at, yeah. A, right at a, a, I think that's a mistake, mm -hmm. right? And that's why we need mediation. I mean, I, I'm very, mm -hmm. uh, mediation departments, we need people mm -hmm. in galleries who are willing to speak to the people who come in, who look up from their PCs mm. and don't stay there looking yeah. down and writing an email to the collector they know might buy the work while they see the student coming in won't buy it. And we spoke about that once and you said, you know, everybody gets a coffee and you try to have this kind of welcoming attitude in your gallery, but that's not... Ev yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, sure. The galleries keep a chunk on the that's also yeah. a problem, of course, yeah. yeah. Mm. But I, oh yeah, I just wanted to also say like, and that's also why I was talking about curiosity because there's definitely been so many moments where um, I've, I've had a show happening in a gallery that I'm working at that I know my mother, if she understood and was open to it, would really resonate with it. But I mean, once she walked into an exhibition folded installation art and said, what is this? This room is empty, you know? <laughs> like if you can't even see what's in the room because it doesn't resonate with what your idea of art is, then it's always gonna be closed to you. But um, I think a sense of curiosity gets you half the way, and then there's so much information um, once you once you kind of open to it. I think these responses kind of directly fold in with what you said because I think that like it depends on who is the art for, and is it is art only relevant for galleries? Because I think in terms of like. Mm the quote unquote hype around black art, it's hype for white people, but not hype for people of color who have been investing and um, also having folk art museums and galleries and things where these pieces have existed prior to coming to more recognized institutions or galleries. So I think um, in terms of like, quote unquote, my mother becoming an, a critic or whatever, mm -hmm. those are what the museums we were frequenting is like folk art mm -hmm. museum spaces where people create out of their house local things like Quilting, for example, is a really big um, thing in the South for African-American women who quilt, and that's a piece of art from our community that we partake in, but we don't necessarily have to see it in a museum in order for it to be quote-unquote art. So yeah. I think like that kind of folds into like my understanding of like who can be an art critic, mm -hmm. when is an art piece validated, and I think like I don't think an art piece is only validated when it's in a gallery, but it's also validated when it's in its local context and its mm -hmm. communal context as well. So I think like that would be my response because even when the African American art bubble burst, there's still going to be African Americans in the Black diaspora that still appreciate that art, regardless of if the art world appreciates it mm -hmm. before or after. So mm -hmm. that would be my exactly. response to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, just uh, also like resonating with this, is also this question or this difference between spoken words, so speaking, talking to each other, or writing. And I think, and I, and it, for me it's so interesting because sometimes I experience critics like saying, oh, this ex exhibition is so complex, how will you do with, deal with that, with the audience? And I think at the same moment, oh, I can do a lot of things here. It's like talking and, you know, inter, in, so in a more intersectional thinking of art, and I think, and also like to think like, uh, uh, yeah, also like this idea of the poetry in, in art critics, I think it's really important. And yeah, and because I, th I think also with this idea of art in, in a dialogue situation is, is, is a quite important thing. And art critics sometimes for me seem like to be have a comment from the outside on these processes mm -hmm. instead of being within in these processes. So this might be probably also a thought for, yeah. You mean the processes of making the art or of looking at it? I'm not sure if I make this distinction. I feel like I'm inside of it, but I think that uh, that's a, a good point. There's a lot of people I know who only look at shows when they're going to review them <laughs> um, and only hang out with artists if they're going to write about them. I think that's like not a good way of going about it. I think that you you have to feel integrated and be integrated into those systems. Um, and I don't think that you can really engage in a clear way unless you, I, but I think that's true for a lot of people. I know gallerists who don't go and see other galleries and works, or I know people who work at museums who, you know, I think it's just one of these things. You can't treat this as a job. Like, it, it, you, have to, you have to really care, even when it has nothing to do with you, and, and think of yourself as existing in an ecosystem, um, which, uh, which some people don't do sometimes. Yeah. I, I must say that that's something I found interesting with mm. you, you guys. Uh, um, the th at least the three of you, you really have your kind of personal quest. Mm. Um, about the oral histories, about the histories of migration and how that art is perceived and mm -hmm. uh, muted and so on. And, and then your, uh, your interest in, in platforming the art uh, uh, of South Africa. And of course there is art criticism as a kind of profession which is much more linked to a gig economy. Mm -hmm. Travel there, write about that, mm -hmm. you get paid. I mean a lot of art critics don't mm -hmm. seem to have a particular agenda, which I also find okay. So I, I wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. go as far as, as you to say, okay, if you, don't, if you only do it professionally, it's less, mm -hmm. your, maybe your writing can be just as good, you know, if you go see a lot of shows and you try to write in a professional way about them. But I, I do find it interesting that you can have a second approach to art criticism, which is like, I'm also writing a bigger narrative mm -hmm. as I write about different shows. Mm -hmm. It's not just I'm going to write a one-off on this show and then a one-off on the next and so on and so forth. Mm. Um, yeah, which uh, and and one of these bigger. I mean, personally, I've I've always felt that I tried to champion a certain art of a uh, certain way of writing about the art, mm. which is kind of my narrative. Not so much that I have a subject, but that I try to write in a subject-specific way. Mm. So not having one one voice that I use for everything by kind of trying to find a voice for the art. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things, or to have the same clarity for writing about art that I would have in writing philosophy, mm -hmm. and not think because it's art, I have to be vague, and I have mm -hmm. to be metaphorical, and I have to be you know, uh, using exemorants, and so on and so forth. So, so, so kind of like, yeah, trying to write, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like, it, I think it's really getting interesting, so I'm a bit, like, <laughs> my heart goes two ways, because on the one hand, I don't want to keep people, as they always say, in these occasions, but on the other, I feel we're having a, a conversation going, so I don't know. Um, shall we take the conversation a bit to the next room for, and we can, it's not going to be as public, but we can have a glass, and also those who were too shy to speak in, the bigger audience can still get to to talk to the one or the other. Would that be okay with you? So I would wrap up at this point. Thank you very much for thank you for sharing so candidly, and and thank you to the great audience as well for really bringing their questions and concerns and being candid about it, uh, which really allowed us then to to speak in a very different way. So.
I really like that. Thank you so much.